All right, welcome everyone. It's uh, great to see everyone here. What a beautiful weather we've been having over the last couple of days um, after that huge uh, downfall. Uh, it's been great to see the sun out and the grass is green. Uh, actually, the church lawn is mowed, so that's, that makes it all the more better to look at. Uh, and today marks the first day in a long time where we are free to sing. Okay, so I think it's about a year since last, almost a year, isn't it? Almost a year since we actually sung in church uh, in earnest. Uh, so I'll, let me encourage you all to raise your voice uh, and sing. Uh, don't, don't listen to the person next to you. Or don't just watch the words coming up, but sing uh, as loud as you can, just as those people at home have been singing their hearts out. We can sing our hearts out here as well. Uh, so on that note, why don't we stand and sing, okay? <laughs> Okay, I would like to read from Psalm chapter 14, and it's a short psalm, so I'll just read uh, all of it. Psalm chapter 14. For the director of music of David, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. Their deeds are vile. There is no one who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven on all mankind to see if there, there are any who understand, any who seek God. All have turned away. All have become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. Do all these evildoers know nothing? They devour my people as though eating bread. They never call on the Lord. But there they are, overwhelmed with dread. For God is present in the company of the righteous. You evildoers frustrate the plans of the poor, but the Lord is their refuge. Oh, that salvation for Israel would come out of Zion. When the Lord restores his people, let Jacob rejoice and Israel be glad. It's an amazing picture of um, God's righteousness in this psalm. How, how often do you actually consider the righteousness of God against the wickedness of humanity. How often do you think that the righteousness of God demands justice for God? I think that's what you want to actually consider this morning, that the justice of God demands judgment. And what does that mean for the rest of the world? What does that mean for us as we live in this world? How should we interact with the world that is still in darkness where no one seeks God? No one seeks to understand God or know him. Um, so let's um, consider God because we know him, don't we? God has given us his spirit to know him, unlike the rest of the world. And for that, we should praise him. We should give glory to him as we have just sung because he has given us understanding where we didn't even seek it in the first place. So let's bow our heads, consider God, and come before him in true worship and thankfulness. Let's pray. Almighty God, maker of heaven and earth, you truly are glorious and worthy of all honor, glory, and power. We praise you, Lord, for your wonderful deeds, your uh, work of creation, and your work of salvation for us. Thank you, Lord, that you are such a wonderful God and a loving God and a merciful God. You're gracious to us and you're kind and good to your people. Thank you, Lord, that you look after us every day that you uh, set our, our feet on the path of righteousness by your spirit and your word, that you have brought us into your presence, not by our works, but by the works of Christ. And, and for that, we give you praise. Lord, when we consider the words of the psalm we just read this morning, we had no right to stand in your presence. We had no right to, we, had, we did not deserve to receive your grace or mercy. And yet you did extend your mercy to us. You showed your love to us by the death of your son. Lord, we are so thankful that you did this for us because, Lord, we truly were hopeless with no way of escaping your coming judgment. So we, we give you praise and thanks for your wonderful work of salvation for us. But, Lord, even though we know this, even though you have moved, uh, moved us from death to life, 
yet we are still in a sinful body that is wrecked by temptation, that we are, we face constant pressure. We face constant pressure to sin and the temptation to follow our own heart. And, and so Lord, we come before you contrite and humbled, confessing our sins. Lord, because we recognize how sinful we can be. We recognize how, how we can still sin in this sinful body. So Lord, we come before you confessing our sins, asking for you to forgive us. And yet we also come to you bold and um, with confidence. Because Lord, you will forgive not because of what we can do or what we can pay back, but because of Christ. Because he has done it all. Because he has cried out, it is finished. We have every confidence to come before you knowing that you will forgive us. So Lord, as we ask you for forgiveness and as you forgive us, we pray, Lord, that you will change us as well. That we will not stop at confession, but you will change and mold us, that we will be trained and, and, and uh, set on a path of righteousness, that we will continue to look at our sins and flee from it, that you, you will open our eyes even more to see the sinfulness of our hearts and, and flee those temptations that, wreck, uh, that surrounds us so much. Help us to live a life of righteousness as you have planned out for us. Empower us by your spirit. Encourage us by your word to live a life that is godly, a, dis a, distinct, li a distinct life to the rest of the world so that we may declare your praises and that we may proclaim your gospel to the rest of the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, um, it's t uh, time for announcements. And in the Roots and Branches, which I emailed out last night, if you haven't received that email, uh, please let me know uh, and give me your email details uh, and I'll forward that to you as well. Um, okay, so as I've mentioned before, the COVID restrictions have been eased again. Uh, the, there is no restriction on singing in places of worship anymore. So we can sing without masks uh, as per usual, but we are still, there are still some COVID uh, safety uh, restrictions we still have to manage. Uh, things like social distancing, 1.5 meters if you are uh, in a, uh, in, indoors. Uh, we need to use our hand sanitizers as often as possible. Um, sneeze into your tissue or your arm uh, rather than into your hands. Uh, and, and please refrain from shaking hands or hugs or kisses. Uh, it's still not allowed at this point. Uh, and if you're unwell, uh, if you're feeling unwell, uh, my, our, our advice is go home or, or maybe even stay home and watch the, uh, and join us on, on Zoom for the service. Okay. In April, the prayer night for April is not gonna be on the Sunday, uh, not next Sunday, but on Thursday night. Uh, so we will actually come here on a, for a special prayer night at seven o'clock. Uh, we will open up with a, a time of reflection on uh, on the Easter events, uh, the Passion Week and the um, the Cross uh, of Christ. So it's going to lead up to that, uh, and then a, a time of personal prayer after that as well. So we'll start at seven o'clock. Uh, we'll have a time of reflection, and you're uh, welcome to stay back to pray for your personal prayers and and go home uh, when you're ready to go home. Okay, so that's the plan for this Thursday. Uh, so be here at seven o'clock when I actually kick off the time of reflection. So if you're if you're not here, um, you'll have, you'll be coming in mid. Uh, it's 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 going to be automated process. So I'm not going to be stopping anything like that. So I'm going to let, get the computer to run, and it's going to go for about 50 minutes, uh, about 45 50 minutes, and then we'll go into time of personal prayer. So uh, if you want to catch all of it, uh, please come early and be on the seats. Um, or by seven o'clock, okay. The Good Friday service will start at 9 a.m. as uh, per usual. Uh, we'll start at 9 a.m. in the morning, not 9.30, so come about half an hour earlier. Uh, and the um, collection for this th uh, Friday uh, will be donated to Aloha uh, Children's Hospital. Uh, if you'd like to find out more information about Aloha, it's all on the web, web page as well. But generous, uh, in, uh, in summary, there are a children's hospital uh, for uh, children with disabilities. Uh, and, and 
and, and families who are trying to care for them. So it's a very um, worthwhile uh, cause. I, I guess it's very worthwhile for us to help uh, the hospital because they're, they're doing a lot of work, not just for the Christian community, but the Sydney community in general as well. So uh, it's good to uh, help them out as much as we can. Easter Sunday service will resume at 9.30 a.m. as, as uh, normal Sunday. Uh, and on su Sunday, uh, Easter Sunday, this Sunday, we will actually celebrate the Lord's Supper. So Lord's Supper is not going to be on the third Sunday of this month, but rather uh, next Sunday uh, to, to coincide with Easter. We will celebrate the Lord's Supper next Sunday during the service. And uh, probably it's a, a bit of good news, I guess. Um, daylight saving ends this uh, next Sunday, which means we get an hour back. Um, so you get an hour more to sleep in, uh, but don't waste it, okay? <laughs> don't waste it. Don't think that, oh, I've got one more hour and so sleep one hour later. Uh, sleep in your normal time and get that extra hour sleep and come to church. Do you come to church early if you don't set your clock back? I think you do. Yeah, yeah. If you don't set your clock back, you'll be here one hour early, which is good. <laughs> you have a whole hour to pray to God and reflect on his good, will, uh, good works for us. Okay. Uh, King's Kids and Youth Group will be on holiday from this week. Uh, so after today, uh, King's Kids will be on a break. And Youth Group had their final meeting last Friday as well. Uh, and so they will be on a break until the next term. Uh, so that's, that's about two more weeks. Uh, in two weeks' time, they will be resuming their ministries. Are there any other announcements that needs to be made? Okay, if there's no other announcements, then I'll pass on to Sam. Good morning, kids. The, the title for our discussion is Daniel in the Lion's Den. It's a popular Bible story, which I believe most of you might have heard before. Um, there was a long time ago, there was a king called Darius. He was so popular, and very powerful, that uh, he appointed 12 leaders and three administrators to help him rule his kingdom. One of these administrators was uh, called uh, Daniel. Daniel was a man who was very faithful to God. He loves God very, very much. And in addition, he was also a good friend of Darius. So Darius decided to appoint him a leader above everybody. And this didn't go well with the men. And so they planned to find something false or wrong with his administration. They searched everywhere. They couldn't find anything wrong with Darius, with Daniel. So they said that this is a man who is so fond of God. He loves God so much above anybody and everything. So if we can use that to find fault against him, I think it will work. So they went to see the king and they said, long live king. In fact, they were flattering him so that uh, he will agree to their proposal. And they said to him, king, you know that you are a very good king. Why don't you make a law so that uh, nobody will pray to any other body, anybody apart from you for the next 30 days? Unfortunately, the king did not read their mind. So he agreed to it. And then he wrote it down and it was passed as a law. Now, Daniel had a problem because every day Daniel will go up in his room, the highest room, and then open the window towards Jerusalem and he will pray three times. He will kneel down and pray. So this was a difficult thing. It, he was in a dilemma. Should he uh, obey the law or stick to God? And uh, the decision that Daniel took 
I will stop here and then we'll watch it on a video. After that, we shall discuss it. There is a passage in the Bible which reads like this. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your path straight. Now the question is, what is your lion's den? What is your lion's den? Uh, the life situation which will force you to change your commitment to God. Daniel stuck to God and he was thrown into the lion's den. What is your situation, a life situation, which will force you to change the way you love God, the way you serve God? And we should remember that God is in control of everything. Daniel stuck to God and uh, God made his uh, path straight. So it is important that no matter what the situation might be, don't be scared because your God is in control. Stick to him and he will make you right, everything right for you. Okay, that's it. let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that if we put our trust in you, you will always be with us. So we pray that Lord, you let your Holy Spirit strengthen us so that when we have faith with such a situation, we know the right decision to take so that you will be with us and guide us through the, uh, that situation. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, thank you, Sam. Uh, it's time for uh, King's Kids. So uh, if the kids would like to go to Sunday school. Thanks, Ibrahim. <laughs> Okay, uh, and it's time for us to pray to God. Uh, are there any um, prayer points that you would like to add? Yes, Josephine. Oh, okay, okay. Okay. Yes, Robin. Okay. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, Jerry. Okay. So did you say it's gotten worse? Okay. Yes, Karen. I was saying. Okay. Okay. Uh, what's his name? Billy. Okay. Okay. Yes. Ah, uh, uh, Betty first. Yeah. Right. Yep. Uh, uh, the right so they're right very happy. Okay. Uh, very well, very uh, very nice. Very oh, praise God. Yes, Sam. Uh, Revelation. Yeah. 
so is that a good thing or a bad thing? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay. <clears throat> oh, yes, Ben. Okay. All right. Um, so, uh, the prayer points I have is for pray for Nadra, um, suffering from back pains and other things, uh, for Robin's friend, John, uh, who's in palliative care, uh, Brian, who still have a lot of congestion, uh, Margaret and Jim, uh, with Margaret uh, memory deter deteriorating further, uh, for Karen, uh, Karen's friend, Billy, whose uh, knee operation's um, not healing well, uh, and for Sam, uh, for Stephen, uh, who's been preaching in the streets, and we are not sure whether that's a, a good thing or a bad thing, so we want God's wisdom to discern the situation. Uh, praise God for Hetty and Fred, that they're settling in well, and they're uh, uh, feeling pretty, they're pretty happy uh, where they are, uh, okay, and that's a, a really good praise point. Uh, and for Ben's family, uh, who's lost his son in the islands. Okay, so why don't we come before God in prayer? Let's pray. <clears throat> Our Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for your wonderful grace uh, to us. Thank you so much that you are a God who listens to our prayers, that you uh, not only uh, have opened yourself to us through your, through your Son, but Lord, you have promised us that every word we speak in prayer, you will listen to. You. And in your good time, in your good will, you will answer our prayers. And so, Lord, for that, we give you thanks and praise that you have given us this confidence to come before you. And with that confidence, we do lay before you some of the prayer points that is on our hearts. Uh, we pray for those who are sick amongst us in our church and amongst our family. Uh, we pray for Nadra, who is uh, suffering from back pains at the moment. Uh, Lord, we pray for healing uh, with Nadra. Uh, we also pray for Brian, who is still suffering from a lot of congestion in his chest. Uh, he's already been through a bout of uh, antibiotics. So Lord, we pray that doctors will be able to figure out a, a more effective way uh, to treat his condition. Uh, we also pray for uh, Margaret uh, and, and Jim. Uh, Lord, uh, it's sad to hear that Margaret's memory is deteriorating at the moment. Uh, so Lord, we pray that, that you continue to be with them uh, to remind Margaret of your love for her and, and to strengthen Jim uh, that he may uh, withstand uh, this situation. We also pray for um, Karen's friend, Billy, who's um, had a knee operation, but it's not, which is not healing well. Uh, so we pray for the healing hands upon him and for his family situation as well. Uh, we pray for Robin's friend, John, who has been moved into palliative care. Uh, Lord, it's, um, uh, it's always sad to see our friends uh, in such a situation and, and especially our family as well. So Lord, we pray for John and his family, especially his 90 year old mom. Uh, that uh, you will give them comfort, that you will be uh, the rock that they need to stand on. Uh, we also pray uh, for Ben's family uh, uh, in the islands who've lost their son. Uh, it's always tragic when uh, life is lost, especially our family. Uh, so we pray that you'll be with the family and Ben, uh, that, that you will encourage them and, and, and um, yeah, encourage them and, and let them know uh, that you're a God who loves and cares for them. I will also praise you, Lord, uh, for Fred and Hattie, uh, that they're happy and uh, well looked after in the, in the, in the time at home. Uh, we pray, Lord, that you'll continue to bless them uh, in, their, in their situations, that uh, they'll continue to enjoy uh, their life and each other. And, and Lord, we also pray for Hattie, that uh, she will continue to hold on to her faith in you. <clears throat> Uh, that her faith would uh, support her and hold her up uh, as she looks forward to you calling her home. 
Uh, Lord, we also pray for the various ministries in our church. We pray for the youth group. We pray for our Sunday school as well. Uh, we pray that, that you'll be uh, with these ministries, vital ministries of teaching the next generation of your word and of, of, and of our Jesus. We pray, Lord, for that, that you'll bless the teachers and the leaders of these groups, uh, that you will empower them by your spirit to know your word uh, and to be able to teach your word clearly and, and, um, and plainly, that they will be able to set an example for them in their lives uh, so that the children and the, and the students will not only learn by listening, but learn also by observing their teachers and leaders. I will also pray, Lord, uh, uh, for the pandemics uh, that's been going around the whole world. Uh, we thank you, Lord, that you have protected us here in Australia uh, far more, uh, where, we, we, where we are far less affected by the pandemic than the rest of the world. Thank you, Lord, for your blessings in that situation. But Lord, we also pray uh, that you would bless the, um, the leaders and the governments uh, with wisdom uh, to be able to manage the situation well, but also to be able to uh, do it in a way that is safe and uh, reasonable uh, for everyone. Uh, Lord, as we look forward to the coming Easter, help us also to fix our eyes on you. Help us, Lord, that, uh, uh, that our thoughts will not be about what we can get or the holidays uh, that's coming around, but Lord, help us to think deeply about Jesus that his death on the cross meant life for us and that his suffering on the cross meant that we were set free. Help us to think deeply about this and drink deeply from your word uh, so that we may reflect well and give you thanks and praise for the wonderful grace we have poured in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, uh, it's time for the Bible reading. Uh, and the reading comes from Romans chapter 3 verses 10, actually verses 9 to 20. <clears throat> okay. Romans chapter 3, verse 9 to 20. <clears throat> what shall we conclude then? Do we have any advantage? Not at all. For we have already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are all under the power of sin. As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Their, their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways. And the way of peace they do not know. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we, have, now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the, through the law, we become conscious of our sins. What are we bow our heads in prayer to God to give us wisdom uh, as we consider this passage? Let's pray to God. Our Lord, we pray that, that you will give us wisdom through your spirit. As we consider the words written in this passage, help us, Lord, to understand them correctly, that we may understand uh, why you will judge the sinfulness of man, why there is no exception in who you will judge. Lord, help us to understand deeply so that as we look forward to Easter, that the grace that you pour out into our lives will be made more magnificent, more glorious, more amazing to us, so that we may truly live our lives in thankfulness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> you know, airplanes are arguably one of the greatest inventions in the modern era. Would you agree? You know, if you think about it, 
flying has been the kind of ambition and dream for humanity for ages. Uh, you know, you should think as far back as you can, people would have been looking up in the sky, looking at the birds and thinking, I wish I could fly. You know? There are even legends and stories written about people who try to fly and fall into the sun. <laughs> I don't know how that works, falling into the sun, but you know, that, that's what happens, isn't it? People want to fly. So when people began to fly on planes, it was revolutionary, wasn't it? It revolutionized traveling. In fact, it made the world seem that much smaller. You know, um, because you could get to places faster. No matter how far or remote a place might be, travel time now is a matter of days, not months, isn't it? You don't have to travel too long to get to where you want to go. Now, if you've ever flown on a commercial flight, have you ever noticed that there are different compartments that as you walk through the doors or uh, through the way, uh, alleyway? Yeah, well, when you first enter at the, at the front of the uh, plane, what do you go through? First Actually, the first class is on top, isn't it? Oh. <laughs> right. Depends on what the plane is. Either it, the first class is either, either on top or is at the front of the, of the plane. Then you go through the first class to the next section is the business class. And so it's still pretty flan fancy. You can actually still lie down uh, and, and play, uh, fly. And then you walk into this massive section at the, in the middle and the back, it's the cattle class. <laughs> <laughs> it's called the cattle class because everyone is jammed together to fit as many people in, uh, in the same flight. Right. Uh, when you fly in the economy or the cattle class, and you look forward into the business section or the uh, first class section, you sort of like, um, appreciate why you would pay more, wouldn't you? To be in that part of the plane, not in this part of the plane, especially when you are sitting next to two big guys <laughs> and there's no elbow room. Uh, <clears throat> you do appreciate that uh, you paying more gets you more space and, and more, uh, yeah, more, more, more space for yourself. Yet, have you, have you ever considered or questioned the wisdom of paying more to fly business for first class? Is it really a wise thing to pay more to fly in the business class or the first class section? Might be more space, could be more space, but think about this. Does your first class ticket get you to your place faster than the people in the economy class? <laughs> Getting to the destination, it could be, you could get there faster because you're at the front of the plane, so it may be a second faster, <laughs> right? but it doesn't get you there any faster, does it? You land at the same time, you fly at the same time, and you're there at the same time. So what's the point of paying two times, three times? How much more is the first class ticket to your, a, a lot more, isn't it? Maybe even 10 times more. I think, I think it's about 10 times more, 10 times more for the first class ticket to get there at the same time. How does that work? You know, how is it wise to spend that much money to get to a place at the same time as a person in this? Um, e e I, I guess it, it really talks about the, the money that you can actually spend. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So it's, uh, it's a funny thing to think about. But what happens when the plane runs into trouble? Right? When, there's a, when there's a problem in the engine, does your first class ticket mean that you get off mid-flight into your new plane? No, if there's, no, they don't have pressure parachute, that's right. They don't have enough parachutes on the plane. Uh, what, what happens is that the plane gets turned around, doesn't it? And it has to land. And no matter what kind of ticket you have, you go through the same trouble as the people in the economy class you will still suffer the same thing. You cannot avoid the disruption simply because you have a first class ticket. No matter how much money you pay for your ticket, it doesn't mean that you get a special advantage in actually traveling to where your destination is. In the same way, over the last few weeks, Paul asked similar questions about Jews and Gentiles. Last week, Paul asked, is there any advantage of being a Jew? And what was the conclusion? Yes, there was. Yes, there was an advantage in being a, a Jew. When we consider their special relationship with God, 
and the fact that they had the very words of God, then the obvious answer is yes, there is an advantage in being a Jew. <clears throat> Yet by the end of verse eight, what is the conclusion that Paul makes? Doesn't matter. Everyone is under the power of sin. Everyone is under the power of sin, which means that everyone will be judged by God. If that is the case, then we need to ask the question again, don't we? Is there an advantage in being a Jew? And that's what Paul asked in verse 9. In verse 9, this is what Paul says. What shall we conclude then? Do we have any advantage? Not at all. For we have already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are all under the power of sin. The answer in contrast to verse 2 is that Paul says, not at all. There is no advantage in being a Jew. Now, while it is certainly good, it's a good thing to be chosen by God, to be his chosen people, uh, treasured possession and all that. But if your salvation, if your salvation depends on your righteousness, is there an advantage in being a Jew? As we saw over the last few weeks, both the Jews and Gentiles fall short of the glory of God. Yeah? Everyone falls short of God's standard. Both the Jews and Gentiles are on a plane that does not have enough fuel to get to their final destination. In this regard, there is no advantage in being a Jew or Gentile. For as Paul says in verse 9, both the Jews and Gentiles alike are all under the power of sin. So the question for us is, why does Paul make this conclusion? Why is, it, why is he saying that everyone is under the power of sin? Surely among the billions of people who have lived in the past and the present, and maybe into the future, there should be at least one person. There must be someone who is declared righteous, who is right, good enough. Surely not, even a, surely not every person born deserves to be judged as a sinner. Surely, I mean, probabilities-wise, there should be at least one person amongst billions of people who have ever lived who was good enough to enter God's heaven. And to that question, Paul says in verses 10 to 12, so if you have your Bible still there, open, um, follow with me as well, read verses 10 to 12. As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Rather than giving his opinion on this matter, Paul speaks from the Old Testament to show that everyone is a sinner. The opening sentence makes it clear that there is no exception in the world. There is no one, not even one, who can claim to be righteous. Before God, all are sinners. Because there is no one who understands or seeks God. Just as Paul has stated in the opening chapters of, of Romans, everyone ignored God. Even though the whole world cries out the glory of God, every single person failed to understand what it means. When they look at the creation, they don't see God. What do they see? They see pretty pictures. They see uh, something that they want to capture and grab and hold on to, but they don't see God. So they found no reason to seek him. This is the story of humanity from Adam to now and into the future. Adam had no need to seek God for his, <clears throat> seek God in his sinfulness. He desired to be like God, so what did he do? He ate the forbidden fruit. And, and what's more, even in his shame, in his guilt of sin, what did he do? Did he seek God? No, he hid from God, didn't he? He hid amongst the trees because he did not want to be found by God. And, and this is a trait, trait that every single person shows in life. When life is good, do people seek God? No one seeks God when life is good. When life is bad, who do they seek? Do they seek God? 
No, they seek gods after their own hearts. They might think it is God, but it is really the gods that they have actually produced from their heart. Every single person considers God more like a genie in a bottle than the creator of heaven and earth. Rather than worshiping God for who he is, every single person looks for what they want. This is what sin is. It is a deliberate turning away from God. And so God declares that everyone is worthless, for there is no one who does good. Not one person meets God's standard. Now, while many people will actually argue that they are generally good, you know, if you look at my life, I'm generally good. I'm not that bad. No, I'm not a criminal. No, I didn't steal, kill, or, 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 or any of those um, really bad things. And, and some others might even point to their lifetime of charity. No, I've spent my whole life helping other people. How can you call me bad when I've done all this good for other people? And still some others might say, look, look at my lifetime of religious uh, commitment. I spent my life in the church. I spent my life in the mosque. I spent my life in whatever religious uh, um, institution. How can you say I'm not good when I have dedicated my life in following my religion? Yet from God's perspective, no one is worthy. No one is good enough. Everyone has sinned by turning away and ignoring God. And we have to agree, if we are honest with ourselves, if we are honest with ourselves, we have to agree with that assessment, don't we? Just reflect on your life. On our own, no one can claim they have sought God. Have you ever really willfully sought God by yourself? Have you really decided to seek after God uh, in your life, all the moments of your life? No one can claim that they have sought God or understood him. So Paul is clear. There is no one righteous, not even one. Every person born, past, present, and into the future are all sinners who deserve God's judgment. But even if we agree that everyone is sinful in some ways, is God right to condemn the person for the bad bits of their life? Surely some of the good things a person does should count for something. Even if there is no one who is perfect, shouldn't God weigh and balance out the good from the bad of, of the person's life? I mean, if you had a good apple, if you had an apple to, that is good to eat, but you turn around and notice a bit of a bruise or, a, 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 I guess, a, a rotten part of the apple, would you throw away the whole apple? Or would you... Normally for free. But if you're really hungry, right, wouldn't you cut off the bit that is rotten or bruised and eat the rest? If the whole app, the rest of the apple is good, wouldn't you just cut away the bad bit and eat the, the good bits? Now, if we can do that for apples, what about a person? Shouldn't God judge the bad bits, but also um, weigh in the good parts of the person? Why can't God accept people who are generally good? Maybe good enough. Against such reasoning, Paul again turns to the Old Testament in verses 13 to 18. So if you have your Bible still there in front of you, uh, just follow after me as I read verses 13 to 18. Their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways, and the ways of peace they do not know. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Paul quotes from different parts of the Psalms and the prophets to build up a picture of a person in God's eyes. Is that a pretty picture when we read through that? Is that a person that you'll enjoy the company of? Right? Would you want to spend the rest of your life with that kind of person, let alone eternity? The picture that Paul develops or paints here is not pretty at all. In listing, listing the sinful, sinful characteristics of a person, 
whole quartz verses that go through different parts of the body. Starting from the throat, tongues, lips, and mouth as a whole, Paul shows that the view into a person's heart is sinful to the core. Why can we say that? Why can we say that a person's heart is sinful? Remember, remember what Jesus said to the Pharisees? In Matthew chapter 12, verse 34, this is what Jesus says to the Pharisees. You brood of vipers, how can you who are evil say anything good? For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. What comes out of the mouth of a person? What is in their hearts, isn't it? What comes out of a person, what someone speaks, is what's in their hearts. Jesus shows that what wells up in our hearts finds its way out through the mouth. So by showing that every organ attached to the act of speaking is corrupt, Paul shows that the heart of the person is sinful. Now imagine a stream of water flowing downhill. If the water upstream is clean, what, what would you expect downstream? Clean water. But can you expect clean water from a stream where the, the water upstream is unclean? Of course not. If the water is unclean up, upstream, then the water downstream will definitely be unclean as well. So if the throat, the tongue, the lips, and the mouth of every person is described as an open grave, deceitful, poisonous, full of cursing and bitterness, if that is what is coming out of a person's mouth, what can we conclude about the heart? Is the heart any good? If all that's coming out of a person's mouth is this list of things, open graves, uh, poison of vipers, full of deceit, bitterness, and cursing, what's, come, what's in the heart then? Exactly what's coming out. It is sinful. The heart is full of the very things described here in verses 13 and 14. Not only that, how does Paul describe the feet and path of a person who walks, <clears throat> uh, 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 the path of a person, the path a person work, walks on? Here we see that the way every person lives is dangerous to others. It, is, it affects other people in a dangerous ways. There is violence, misery, and conflict in the path of sinners. It speaks about how every person is self-centered. They're not looking out for other people. They're only looking for themselves. And, and, what can you, and what can you expect? Can you expect anything different from a person with a sinful heart? Can you expect a person that is selfless when you know they are sinful in their heart? And this is true if we truly reflect on our own heart as well. Quite often in our self-centeredness, we don't seek the good of others first, do we? If given the opportunity and if you can get away with it, what would we do? We would choose to do what is more self-centered, what we, what we desire, what is easiest for us. We want what is best for ourselves, even if it means we, we have to trample others for it. We will take every opportunity to get ahead at the expense of other people and this would be true for any person. But deep down, what is our heart doing? Is our heart, is our heart good and righteous and peaceable and, and all that? No. Our heart is deceitful. It, 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 it rages. It, it, um, it, it chases after its own satisfaction. Which is why there is no fear of God before their eyes. If your heart is always turned away from God, if your heart only seeks self-gratification, then what will your eyes seek out? If your heart is always about yourself, what will your eyes look at? Will it seek God, the goodness of God? Obviously not. You will only look and seek what your heart desires. So we can see that there's nothing in us that can be acceptable to God. It is not like cutting away a bit of us that is bad. If the heart is bad, what's going to happen to what we say and do? 
everything is going to be bad. Everything will be tainted by a sinfulness if our heart is evil. If our heart speaks evil, if our heart leads us down the path of sin, if our heart keeps directing our eyes away from God, do we have any right to raise any objections to God's judgment? Can we say, I'm good enough? What about the good parts of my life? What about those people who have done good all their lives? Can we put those uh, excuses before God? What's more, if the Jews who at the words of God stand condemned for their disobedience, then can Gentiles claim innocent because of their ignorance? And that's a no, isn't it? That's what we've been seeing in Romans. When God chose Israel as his treasured possession, what did he say that they, they will become? They will be for, for God a kingdom of priests. What is the role of a priest? A priest is to be a mediator between God and his people. So if Israel is supposed to be a kingdom of priests, what are they supposed to be? They are supposed to be the mediator between God and the rest of the world. So if the mediator, Israel, is found wanting and condemned for their sinfulness, what's, what's that going to mean for the rest of the world? If Israel failed in their disobedience and failed in their um, relationship with God, what does that mean for the rest of the world when their, their mediator is so corrupt? Can the world survive? Can the rest of the world survive when Israel is condemned? Obviously not. Unless we are actually led and taught and guided by a mediator to righteousness, there's no way the rest of the world would know what righteousness is. If the people who at the very words of God cannot be righteous and teach others of, of righteousness, then the rest of the world have no, no hope of being righteous. And, and that's what it, Paul is saying here in verse 19. If the Jews are condemned, then the rest of the world is condemned as well. There is no way to escape the God's coming wrath. So what can we conclude? What can we conclude? Everyone is a sinner without exception. No one can claim innocence. Nothing we do or say can mitigate God's judgment against us. All that is left is a fearful expectation of God's judgment. Unless someone comes in, unless someone comes in and rescues us, there is no way to escape God's righteous anger. How can we know God, let alone seek him with a sinful heart? And so the Apostle Paul is right to condemn everyone as a sinner, deserving of death and judgment which is bad news for every human being born, isn't it? Every human being born is born in sin. For if sin is universal to everyone, and if every person is totally depraved in their sinfulness, and if there's no human mediator to help and guide us in the path of righteousness, then what hope do we have in escaping God's judgment? If what Paul says today is true, then is there any hope of redemption for anyone? Is there any hope for anyone to escape the coming wrath of God? If sin is universal and if sin is, uh, if every person is totally depraved in their sin, is there any hope of rescue for anyone in the world? The picture is bleak, isn't it? There is no hope of escape. That is why we need God's grace and mercy. Without God's, without God's love in sending his son to die on the cross, we would have no excuse and no way out before God's righteous anger. But because God sent his son Jesus to die in our place, we have hope. Over Good Friday and Easter Sunday next week, we will look at how Jesus did what was impossible for us. But for today, let's reflect firstly on how utterly hopeless we were before God's judgment. 
as we look forward to celebrating Easter, let's remember that the only way we escaped God's judgment was not by our works, but because of Jesus. He is the mediator we desperately needed. He is the one who came in to rescue us when we couldn't say or do anything to save ourselves. Which is why what we read in, in um, John chapter 3, verse 36. In John chapter 3, verse 36, Jesus concludes, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on him. So if you haven't yet put your faith in Jesus, then choose life. Believe in Jesus. He is the only way out. There is no other way to escape God's judgment. But if you have already put your faith in Jesus, then rejoice that we are rescued, not by our works, but by the grace of God who promises us eternal life with him. Rejoice that our righteousness does not depend on our works but is solely dependent on the righteousness of Christ. What great news is that? That when the, the law that condemns us has been fulfilled by Jesus. We don't have to trust in our own works. Now, if we're honest, our hearts condemn us, doesn't it? Our hearts condemn us as sinners. We have no way of escaping that guilt and shame. Only Jesus coming in has rescued us by his righteous action. And for that, we give glory and praise to our God, our Savior. And let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for your wonderful grace. Lord, as we have reflected this morning, help us to understand the, even more deeply the depths of the depravity of our sins that what we thought was good enough was, was never good enough. But what we thought was good was evil in your eyes. And there was no way that we could justify or be uh, pay back uh, for what we have done. And, and so Lord, as we understand the magnitude of our sin even more, we can turn around and, and understand and, and, and revel and rejoice in the, uh, in the magnitude of your grace that your grace in through Jesus is so big, so amazing, that it truly overwhelms us, leaves us speechless. Help us, Lord, to reflect deeply on these truths as we live through our lives, that, that our, our life will be motivated by your grace, which you poured out into our lives through your son. Help us to understand uh, you. Help us to understand Jesus. Help us to understand each other more and more so that we may truly reflect your glory in the way we speak and in the way we live. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, it's time for our final song. Um, again, uh, please sing louder. I think I, I think I heard a bit more singing today than before. Uh, so it'll be good to see <laughs> So it'll be good to hear everyone sing, especially at people at home as well. Um, so we'll sing our final song and um, just to remind there's the collection box at the back as well uh, for your offering. Let's sing our final song. Uh, and that you have given us uh, all that we need uh, in this life. And, and so Lord, we give you th praise and, and offer to you this collection. Uh, we pray, Lord, that this collection will be used for your glory and honor, that your church here in St. Mary's will be diligent in using these funds to promote your gospel and to pro uh, proclaim your name amongst the um, people in this community who desperately needs to hear your gospel. Uh, we give you thanks and praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, um, please stick around for uh, uh, some conversations and fellowship. Uh, and don't forget the cleaning as well. We still have to clean the church. Uh, the Deaf Fellowship are now meeting today. So just uh, wipe down everything and uh, that'll be good. Um, let's say the grace together uh, and then we'll conclude the service.
May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.